So um, should I begin talking? My agenda is to start. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me here. It is really a treat. This is my first time in this area of Florida. My first time joining you at your campus. Thank you to Dr. Cantor and Dr. Um, Jameson. And as you know, putting on an event like this, there are so many people involved in your yummy lunch, setting up, cleaning up, organizing. So I thank all of those folks, and I thank you all for joining me. So I've been asked to do one of these, I'm standing at a podium, I'm going to talk to you a lot. Um, I've got PowerPoint in the interest of showing you how we can like push our own boundaries and take risks. I could talk to you endlessly about Jewish critical race theory, but the PowerPoint, that was my big challenge because I'm not a technical person. So just remember, we all stretch our comfort zones in all sorts of ways. So, um, so this is a real treat for me to actually figure out how to do this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, and please keep eating. So, um, you know, one, I'm going to ask you for, so a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about, a lot of, uh, you, I don't know you yet, but many people in the African American community don't know about the Jews in uh, this community. A lot of folks in Jewish communities don't know a whole lot about African Americans in Jewish communities. So some of it, maybe you can already do a way better job than I can, and you know all of it, and a, a lot of it probably will be new to different segments of those of us in the room. <coughs> so I'm just going to ask you, help about how by show of hands, and no one's forced, but how many of you would say you could name or know, let's say three to five African Americans in different Protestant denominations, Methodist, Baptist? Three to five. Come on, shots. <laughs> You're having to hand me school. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to move on. I'm going to leave that to your professors and your All right, then how many of you could name or know personally maybe three to five African American Catholics? A little fewer. How many of you can name about three to five African American Muslims? <coughs> Actually, more than Catholics. Nice, interesting. Now here's my next one. This is why you invited me. How many of you know at least three to five African American Jews? All right. So that's what we're here to talk about today and put us in the constellation of these other communities of different ways of seeing African American communities. <coughs> so question, at EWC, <coughs> why are we gonna learn, why do we wanna learn a little bit more about African American Jews? And you know, there's so many reasons, but most I'm just gonna share. In my view, if you're interested in the vibrancy, American Jews are a very small percentage of the US population, of the global population. But of course, you know, we like to think we matter, people matter. So, if, and certainly if you're interested in African American life, if, if you're interested in the vibrancy of African American life and the diversity within African American communities, the richness of African American history, I suggest, you know, we could do at least a semester long of a series of courses on this subject. Today we get a little overview introduction and maybe it'll inspire some of you to write your master's theses or your senior theses or go on and do doctoral work because there's lots to look at. And I also bring this to you quite humbly <laughs> in your roots in, um, in the AME Church, which as far as my experience very little, but my experience with friends in the AME Church, so, so dynamic religiously, spiritually, and theologically, and the AME Church is known for its vibrant intellectual inquisitiveness. So I think some of the concept of bringing me here and having our afternoon together like this is to keep up that tradition. So I'm going to bring you way back. I'm not an American historian. As a historian, some of the folks in the room are historians. <coughs> Um, you may not know that there are records of black Jews in the United States when the United States was a, were a series of European colonies that date back to 1660, 1668. <coughs> On record, supposedly, I'm living in New England right now, I'm at the University of New Hampshire, an African, -Ameri an African heritage man by the name of Solomon is recorded as actually perhaps the first Jew to live in New England. <coughs> Did you know the first Jew in New England was African? Heritage. 
And there are also <coughs> some other records back from that time, from the later 1600s. So we're talking about, for as long as Africans have been on this continent, there have also, there's a history of African American Jews. Just to let you know, why on earth is she talking? Why did someone put me up here instead of down there having lunch with you? <coughs> I'm gonna just introduce two things about myself. One, professionally, as an academic, I'm a political philosopher. As I was introduced, <coughs> some of the way that I see what I do as a professor is um, Jewish diversity politics, and that includes Jewish critical race theory and Jewish racial diversity. So in that, that includes African and African heritage Jews, and African Americans, Jews, and history. So that part of why someone chose to bring me down here to share the afternoon with you is because of my academic credentials. <laughs> Come on in and have your lunch. And then also, I just want to share, maybe we can talk later, but personally, community. Communally, my own family is a multiracial Jewish family, a mix of Eastern European and African American Jews that make up my personal family. And then communally, how I do Jewish community in the United States. I'm very active. My community is a multiracial Jewish community. And maybe you don't even know that those existed, but one, um, an organization that's been really key for my family and my, uh, the people that I know is an organization, which we may talk about again a little bit later, called the Jewish Multiracial Network. Um, and so my family spends a lot of time there. It's one of our key Jewish spaces. Um, and lots of great stuff happens there. All right, so what I want to do, there's a lot of questions about naming and how do you conceptualize this field. If you're talking about African American Jews or African heritage Jews in the United States, I'm going to try not to be too, too academic for you, but I'm going to set the terms a little bit. So I'm going to introduce three ways to imagine sort of clusters of folks in this overarching community. Thank you. And so I'll introduce them each, and then of course show that they're not separate groups. Of course, they all intermix and intertwine. So the three are African American Jews within what I'll call, and if you need me to um, define terms, normative rabbinical communities. The next one would be a smaller group of African Jews in the U.S. who are kind of recent immigrants. They're recent, they're immigrants from Africa, um, <coughs> or maybe their parents, because now we have the next generation. And then the third one would be a group. Uh, that I'll refer to as African heritage and Israelite communities. So I'll introduce each in turn and then of course later show how, of course, they're not separate. I'm also going to introduce four sort of theoretical or conceptual paradigms for how are you going to begin to even think about this topic that I was asked to share with you today. <laughs> so the first one, we'll be talking about Jewish and Israelite African history. The next one, how that moves from Africa to the U.S how that then plays into racial constructions and separations in the U.S. system, and then remaining separations and connections. So that's the layout of the whole, and now I'll get into some of the details. <coughs> All right, so if you're ready to come with me. So the first one, African American Jews with the normative rabbinical Jewish communities. So the first thing we face, or I face all the time when I do this, are problems with paradigms that don't work for our lived lives. So often enough, around celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day in January, us people like me will get asked to come to different communities to give a talk, and this is usually the way the talk. Marla, will you come talk to my community about the history of Jews and blacks in the civil rights movement? Beautiful, so glad to be asked. But the, fr the very framing of the talk is a problem. <coughs> so, if you don't know, a lot of the Jews in the room will know. Jews love to understand our history as part of the Civil Rights Movement. We're very proud of a, of a number of our very famous Jewish leaders, Abraham Joshua Heschel, <coughs> and some other important rabbis and Jewish communal figures who marched alongside um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other leaders um, in the Civil Rights Movement, and that's all great. <coughs> And then the question, there is a question, a lot of that history, as I'm sure you're learning, gets told through the male leaders. So then there's a whole realm, this is one really fantastic book, um, that talks about the history, not only through the male leaders, but the women leaders and all the Jewish women who were also part and leaders. The majority of the northerners, and this is, I know, very controversial, 
The majority of the northerners who came down to the south for the freedom rides, particularly the majority of the women, were all Jewish. And not everybody knows that. Um, this is a great scholarly book. But the point is <coughs> that the framing of this even concept, African American Jews, African Americans, and Jews in the civil rights movement, presumes these two separate and separative groups, African Americans and Jews. And what we need to do, if we're going to take on our topic, is we need to also recognize there are separate groups of African Americans and Jews, but we also then need to talk about African American Jews. And look that they're not necessarily conceptually or in lived experience separate. So I'm going to give you a more recent example. <coughs> Some of you may have been following a lot of the politics in the women's marches since the recent presidential election. And a lot of what made mainstream media was as if there were these fights or difficulties and struggles and tension between the women of color in the women's march and the Jewish women in the women's march. Now, some of that was real. There's a lot to work on with racism and anti-Semitism and joining our communities. <clears throat> but again, this is a recent example where the community of women of color and the community of Jewish women are presumed to be separate. So if we're still in this land of sort of African-American Jews with normative rabbinical communities, we have some data by now. It was groundbreaking at the time in the, <clears throat> in the um, 90s and early 2000s. And now that's more than 20 years old, but we still, we don't have, some of the specific data in this study hasn't been updated specifically, so we still often refer to this, but understand it's relatively old, because that's more than a generation. It was done by an organization called the Chol Lashon, which means in Hebrew, in every tongue. And that study done in the late, <coughs> in the late um, 90s and early 2000s, estimated that, so by now, so the first Jews who came to the United States were likely African, the next group who came to the United States were those fleeing the, the Spanish Inquisition in Spain. And so those are a different group than people who look and practice like me, some Spanish heritage Jews I'm from Northern Europe. <coughs> At this point in the United States, most people, if you have a, some sort of stereotype of a Jew, you're thinking of someone, I'll just say, like looks or something similar to me. Northern European, I'm Eastern European. Uh, the term is Ashkenazi, is our ethnic background. <coughs> But as much as people still, then we think, then people think that's who Jews are. But actually 20%, those Ashkenazi Jews are a minority of Jews in the world. And in the United States, although after the 1800s with the German Jewish immigration and around the turn of the century, kind of my folks with pogroms coming from Eastern Europe, a little more added after the Holocaust. Now, yes, the majority of Jews in the United States our Northern European heritage. But as you know, that doesn't mean that's the whole of it. So these studies showed <coughs> that at least 20% of the US Jewish population is comprised of a combination in sort of US parlance, people of color or non-European heritage or non-Ashkenazi Jews. So it's 20% out of 6 million. Your math is better than mine. That's over a million Jews in the United States. So just to tell you, so some of my work in this area I'm going to um, share these books with your, I'll tell you why about some of these, but amongst various books I'm going to give to your library and Dr. Jameson, um, some of the books that he mentioned. Um, so what I want to bring you up to is that more recently, this rockin' African-American Jewish communal leader and scholar, her name is Alana Kaufman, <coughs> she was long uh, the head of public affairs and civic engagement um, at the Jewish Community Relations Center in San Francisco, a very large center. And most, if you don't know, most American Jewish organizations were relatively highly organized. Most are not religious organizations. Most US Jewish organizations are sort of civic, like your historical society. They're mostly civic organizations. <coughs> and then Alana went on to be the director of this Jews of Color field building initiative. So I'm gonna share some materials from how Alana has brought up the Bukala Shon data of the 20% and looking forward. So what she does, if you see on the right, the Jewish people of color <coughs> from 2003, um, that's the data that I showed you about 20%. And then she looks at Pew studies. If you don't know Pew, Pew is a relatively reputative, reputed, you know, reputable polling organization um, that's looking at, we have at least over 50% of intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. 
And then she brings it further up. That if you also look at US census data on interracial marriages, we're moving to about 10% generally. And so she's talking about what do we need to do to prepare the US Jewish community and in the United States in general, because within a generation, we're going to actually, the US Jewish population is going to be majority people of color. So right now, most of us are a little looking like me, Eastern European. Within a generation, these statistics suggest there's going to be a major change, and the US Jewish population is going to be over 50% people of color. So let me sort of ground you. I know we have young folks and students and older folks, so it's hard for me to know kind of how to pitch who you might recognize, but just bear with me. If you don't know some of these people, that's totally cool. Some of them you might not know and you may want to know after you're reminded who they are. But so how, so who, who constitutes some of this group? We have our famous Jewish converts, U.S. entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. We have some of you know about Jamaica Kincaid, Afro-Caribbean writer, political thinker. These are some of her, she's written many, many books, lovely. If you didn't know, Jamaica Kincaid is Jewish. Okay, so a lot of folks who you know or may want to know about who are leaders as African Americans actually are also Jewish, and we just might not know that. <coughs> just some others, Julius Lester is a very important civil rights activist. Um, and writer, um, Walter Mosley, some of you know from his detective novels. Jewish, Jewish, right? We also have a situation more recently about adoption. This is a film called Off and Running about um, an African-American kid adopted into a multiracial Jewish family. It's a lovely film, you should see it. <coughs> blended family, you know, so how do people become who they are in their families? We've got the situation of blended families. This is a lovely young adult fiction book, so all of us can read it, it's very rich. And it tells the story of there's a, a mom and a daughter, African American, not Jewish, there's a father and a son, <laughs> white Jewish, and the father and the mother get together and make a blended family, and then the family becomes a multiracial Jewish family, they all become Jewish. So, you know, there's blended families. <coughs> then we get multiracial Jews in all sorts of ways. So, some of you, I am of the generation, I know her parents, some of you know Zoe Kravitz. <laughs> Because Zoe Kravitz, so the new thing on the block, I'm not very good with popular culture, but she's cast in the, in the new, as a new Catwoman, and she's in American society, understood as beautiful, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so Zoe Kravitz is a multiracial Jew. Zoe Kravitz's parents, the older folks in the room will know, her mother was Lisa Bonet, a well-known actress, known as African-American. Her mother is mixed African-American Jewish. Her father is Lenny Kravitz. Some of you still know his work or his music. Yeah. Lenny Kravitz is also mixed African-American Jewish. Two mixed African-American Jewish people had Zoe Kravitz, and she's navigating all of those identities as well. OK, again, please forgive me because I'm so bad on pop culture. Some of you know about Drake. Some of you know about his bar mitzvah video, where he took clips from So he's known as an African-American, I don't know what you call him, if it's a rapper or I don't know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Some of you know about this video, where he actually used footage from when he was 13 in his bar mitzvah, and then he kind of did, in the video of the film, in the, for, the, for the song, he does a celebration of his re-bar mitzvah, right? So, you know, African-American Jews are actually all around us. Some of you may know about, they're often called the movement kids, sort of 1960s kids. So Rebecca Walker, maybe some of you know her, maybe some of you would like to know her, a U.S. writer. She is the daughter of someone you may be more likely know, Rebecca Walker. So Rebecca Walker had a child with a white Jewish man. Their daughter is also a writer and a political figure, Rebecca Walker. One of her many books, she's really interesting, Black, White, and Jewish talking about that multi, <coughs> uh, multicultural history. So Rebecca Walker, you know, you can't get more like a wonderful African-American history. Her daughter, African-American Jewish. <coughs> a lot of you know Amiri Baraka. Amiri Baraka married Hetty Jones, a white Jewish woman. They have a rockin' daughter, Lisa Jones, who's also an activist and a writer on her own. So, <coughs> so Amiri Baraka is the father to a mixed-race Jew, and Lisa, Lisa Jones is very interesting. There's just 
We have lots. I'm going to just give you some highlights of people who are sort of well known or you might want to know about them. Lonnie Guineer, some of you know, top notch um, critical race legal scholar, first woman of color appointed at Harvard Law School, mother, a civil rights, white Jewish civil rights activist, father. <coughs> um, <coughs> was Panamanian born and Jamaican, moved to Harlem. He was in one of the first classes that admitted blacks to Harvard College in 1929. She is the product of this history, mixed black, Jewish. Um, and then she, some of you also may be old enough to remember where you might have studied in your classes. Bill Clinton was trying to change things up when he was becoming president and he created a whole new office of civil rights enforcement and Bonnie Guineer was gonna be the first one to do this. And then, as you know, too often, she had interesting, fantastic ideas, and the nomination was squashed, and she never took the position. So she has a long history, but again, one of our most high-profile civil rights, known as black civil rights lawyers, is mixed African-American Jewish. And so I also want to bring you back the concept of movement kids. I don't know how much you know about this stuff. It goes back before the 1960s and the, that version of the movement. In the history of the era of the Communist Party, the Communist Party had a disproportionate amount of Jews and African Americans. And so, of course, they're doing politics together, creating culture. There's different kinds of unions. So I have, there's an article in one of my earlier books, um, <coughs> The Narrow Bridge by a scholar named Gerald Horn, who talks about the history. His article is titled Black, White, and Red, Jewish and African American um, in the Communist Party. And then we take that, that's again imagining mostly that these communities were somewhat separate, but he's showing how they worked far more closely than people understood, because the concept of movement kids predates the 60s. So then we have this lovely, Jeff, Jeff Jeffries is a lovely, Guy is a professor and he writes his own story. He's the product of one of these unions. In the con parents were communist activists. <clears throat> one, white, one parent is a white Jewish parent, one parent is a non Jewish black man, and his book is Black, Jewish, and Red in the 1950s. So there's so much here. All right, so then you get contemporary scholars. Katya Gibalazule, really interesting. She's out of Grinnell College, and one of her books is Black, Jewish, and Interracial. It's not the color of your skin or the race of your kin and other myths. So people have been working on this. If you want to start to study, there's plenty of you to look into. I want to give you some examples about what does our lives look like in these multiracial communities. So in terms of public access organizations of or for African American Jews, and sometimes they're gonna, these groups are going to be mixed because our numbers are small, also with Jews of color more generally and a group called Mizrahi Jews. So there are lots of Jewish organizations for African American Jews, you know, self-developed organizations, places for people to do their own thing. I've already mentioned the Jewish Multiracial Network and Bacall has shown, <laughs> and there are a bunch more. Jews and all use, Mocha Juden. I'm not, I don't even have any Facebook, so I'm sure you'd find a hundred more that I don't even know about. And then there have been in recent years too, I don't know if you're familiar with the sort of movement of the convenings. So um, <coughs> there have been two Jews of color convenings organized by African American Jews, 2017, 2018. The first one was organized, the Jewish Multiracial Network partnered with an organization called Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. And so there was one in 2017, we did it again in 2018. There's something called the Jewish Women of Color Resilience Circle. It's led by this fantastic, happy to tell you more about her in Q&A, African-American Jewish um, thinker and organize, organizer, et cetera, and it's for Jewish women more broadly, not just African-American women. There are an endless amount of more local groups. So here's one I'm now living outside of Boston. There's the Jews of Color, I'm just giving you like random examples. <laughs> Jews of Color, Greater Boston. The Bacala shown in San Francisco has a multiracial Jewish circle in San Francisco. They also have a summer camp for the kids, and they imagine it as building the, leader, the next generation of leadership of African-American and multiracial Jewish kids. <coughs> There's something called the Multiracial Multicultural Jewish Alliance that's actually out of the South. This fantastic woman, if you don't know her, you might know her, Therese Johnson out of Atlanta, Georgia. So she also has a Facebook group, so that gets more national. 
And then a lot happens locally in Atlanta, and we can talk about her more. She's, uh, she just does really such beautiful work. She's an amazing community organizer. <clears throat> These are just some of her books. She's just ridiculously, wonderfully prolific. And then there are cultural groups. This great thing should happen to your campus, the Afro-Semitic experience. There's just lots. So I'm going to give you switch the paradigm a little bit to US Jewish organizations that then also have specialized cohorts or caucuses within them. So they're broader organizations and have cohorts or caucuses for African-American Jews, Jews of color, Mizrahi Jews. So one that I mentioned already, which is one of the most, doing some of the most interesting work, it's an activist group, mostly out of New York City, but its work is so amazing. It has a little bit of a broader reach, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. <coughs> and um, they, for example, so any Jew can join, but then in order to work on and build, work on racism in the Jewish community and build leadership, they have a People of Color Caucus, working in multiracial co coalitions outside the Jewish community as we build our own multiracial Jewish organizations. There's this interesting organization called Ben the Ark <coughs> that's doing a lot of work, and then they also have special cohorts every so often. One is an example from Sela <coughs> of leadership development for, for Jewish of color cohorts. There's a lovely, this is mostly web-based, but you can get their posters, an organization called the Jewish Women's Archives partnered with Jewish Multiracial Network that I've been talking to you about. So in celebration of our, the Jewish holiday of Purim, Jewish holiday of Purim, it comes a little early springish. Well, for me, it's early because I live in the north. But um, it celebrates the story of Esther. It's a story, it's, it tells the story of Esther, who's a Persian Jewish woman. So getting outside a little bit of the European, these are our ancient texts. So making use of that wonderful multicultural Jewish history Putting, they put together these series that not only focus more on European, European, European Jewish women. So this is, so they put together these profiles to this really nice public um, campaign. And so these are some examples in one of their groups, uh, Filipino woman rabbi, <coughs> um, Asian American, all sorts of Korean American, some really great Jewish women leaders who are women of color. And in that same one, there's this the fantastic selection, it was called Share Her Story, of these four totally fantastic African-American women who I've talked to you about, Therese. There's also Rabbi Sarah Lawrence. Um, Erica Davis is an amazing thinker and community organizer. Sabrina Jerner, Sojourner has, it's just her voice and musicality are so beautiful. She lives just in the DC area. And then they did another one another year, Share Her Story. And this one also has um, Angela Bookdahl Warner, who's Korean American. <coughs> Diane Cole Essie is an old friend of mine who's the first and only Syrian woman rabbi ever on the planet. And some other folks from a variety of communities, but also some folks particularly in our concern of African American history. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Carol Olivia Heron, who's over at the end. April Baskin is a fantastic, you're going to see her name coming up, fantastic community organizer. You've heard about Alana Kaufman. <coughs> um, Yuvila McCoy, who I mentioned with the Jewish, the Women's Resilience Circle, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her. And um, one of the first black woman rabbi ordained in the United States was Alyssa Stanton, and she was also a Southerner. So anyway, yeah, there's lots, you know, we need more, but there's lots of resources and there's lots of fantastic people doing lots of great things. So another of these initiatives in a larger Jewish organization <coughs> that's developing these cohorts, Union of Reform Judaism, the synagogue that's bringing me here with Larry Cantor is affiliated with a religious movement called Reform. They're the largest religious movement of American, American Jewry. And they have had a number of specific <coughs> cohorts to develop um, Jews of color and African American leadership in the movement, the largest movement. And so in 2018, Juvie Nation, they did the Jews of color cohort, and then that enabled them to broaden a little bit, 2019 to now, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so there's lots of things like that. One more I'm just going to share with you is that then there was a series of private fa family foundations <coughs> that created this thing called the African American Jewish Think Tank. And again, their concept is building the field of Jews of color, and a lot of these folks are folks that you're, I'm already introducing you to, and I'll tell you a little bit more about, because we're trying, you know, we're all trying to build leadership. <coughs> I'm gonna switch, this will be the smallest section, to talking about, is a different way to conceptualize, huh, what do we mean African American Jews, okay? 
So I'm talking, and then in this section, just going to tell you a little bit about African Jews who are in the United States in terms of recent immigrations, like they themselves are alive and migrated, or they you know, came here and had their kids. <coughs> so sometimes when, so I know you all mean different things. Often when we say African American, we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. So mostly I'm staying there, but just to remind you, that there was large ancient Jewish communities across North Africa. <coughs> and so like when Bukhala Shan does its statistic, about 10% of American Jews that are not European Ashkenazi, they're mostly talking, that 10% would mostly be from Northern Africa, okay? <coughs> and those are countries like Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. But now let's get to some of you, I know this is very controversial, Northern Africa, still Africa, and then some people want to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, so I'm going to try and just be clear about that. <laughs> if we're moving outside of traditionally European Christian creation of Northern Africa, <coughs> we get, I don't know if you know, but the founder and very first professor of Afro-American studies at Harvard University, his name is Ephraim Isaacs. <coughs> He's a Yemeni, Yemenite, and Ethiopian Jew. And after Harvard, he's moved more recently as a founder and director of the Institute of Semitic Studies at Princeton. The founder of African American Studies at Harvard is a Jew, and he's from Ethiopia. He's an immigrant. And um, partly what I do, it's not about telling me, part, one of the reasons I brought this, the other reason this has, this book has the article by Gerald Horn. <coughs> it also has, if you search Ephraim Isaac's scholarship, for some reason, maybe because the book is old and it, I know nothing about technology, but it doesn't usually come up in a search, probably because it was sort of pre-digital. But one of Ephraim Isaac's earliest published writings on Ethiopian Jews was done in the late 80s and early 90s in this book that I published with the Cornell West and that won this Human Rights Award. So Ephraim Isaacs, you won't, I want to tell you about it because it mostly doesn't come up in searches. But one of his earliest articles is actually on the situation of Ethiopian Jews back in the 90s. And <coughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't yet know any statistics about African, current African migrants in the Jewish community. I just know anecdotally from living in my communities personally and intellectually. <coughs> so there's community in, in Uganda and I know various sometimes. There are already some folks are starting to migrate. Uh, there's a new younger woman who's actually now in Uganda, going to be the first woman rabbi from Uganda. She's being trained in New York at the Reform Synagogue, again, the synagogue that's hosting my talk. And then I know that some other lovely guys from Ethiopia, and we'll talk more about that. And this one guy that I really, he's such a sweet guy, young guy. He's studying right now at Yeshiva University. So I don't have any stats, I just can share anecdotally that of course there are folks who are in these African Jewish communities today who are sometimes migrating because migration happens. Um, but now I want to get into a slightly more complicated, very fun, um, example of people I'm going to call um, African heritage Hebrew and Israelite communities. Okay, so that's my third of the three. And now I'm going to reintroduce these sort of theoretical paradigms. So in talking about Jewish and Israel African history, now what we're doing, we talked a little bit about Africa, I'll then have to talk to you about how that translates into the U.S. situation, and then we'll talk about racial constructions and separations in the U.S., and, and, and end up talking about continuing and remaining situations for us today, separations and connections. So that's, again, that's the layout. Now I'll give you the examples. So <clears throat> one of the things that comes up, and in some of my conversations, I, was, I came down here on Monday night and already have had so many lovely conversations with so many questions. So um, <clears throat> one thing that does come up is this question of names. Um, so, <clears throat> Sometimes um, the names are erased, so you may know the word Jew. Jew is kind of an odd name for people like me. Because Jew is the name of Judah, one of the 12 ancient tribes of Israel. It's just one of the tribes. For a variety of reasons in the course of the last couple of thousand years, in the West, 
many people you might know as Jews came to be called Jews. But that's a whole big thing I'm not going to go into today, but it's kind of odd because that was just one tribe of 12. The way you talked about the people of Israel is that name was Israelite. When we were referring to those people, and many of you know your Bible, when they were in captivity, held as slaves, they referred to the people of Israel are called Hebrews. And a lot of times in the United States, the word mosaic, coming from Moses, the mosaic code or laws of Moses. So these are some words that get used in English. <laughs> and in the US, there are millions of non-white or non-European or non-Ashkenazis or people of color. <coughs> When we're talking about Africa today, so usually the way people make, do these counts, they're relatively trained social scientists, and also you kind of have to make up a lot. So usually today, the world Jewish population that is usually referred to consists of about 15 million people. And I know that that is a spit in the bucket for folks, because there's so many more Africans, but so generally 15 million is a number. But I don't know if you know that there's about another 15 million folks in Sub-Saharan Africa today that are engaged in what I call Jewish and Jewishly related activities. Double the size of the known Jewish world today. And why don't we know about this? Because African American scholars don't always study Jews, and Jews don't always study Af Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? So some people are doing both. So, <coughs> remind you of the beautiful map of Africa. <coughs> As I said, some of the, if you don't know, you'll soon know, the communities of Africa that people are more likely to know of their ancient Jewish histories are from Northern Africa. All good. But there are also these millions of people involved in Jewish and Jewishly related activity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm just gonna quickly give you a tidbit about this because um, I want to talk about some other things. <laughs> so many, some of them consider that their origins are from ancient Israel, and they have various ways of discussing that. Some are new. Some sometimes there's talk about the lost tribes. Sometimes it's an indigenous thing about the lost tribes, and sometimes it's an interesting um, taking on of some European colonial um, concepts. <laughs> um, some now identify as. Jewish and also other things like Christian or Muslim. Some identify as only Jewish. So there's a, you know, we're talking about millions of people across the entire continent. Work with me on another lecture. There's only so much I can tell you today. <coughs> and some in terms of their interests and relationship to world Jewry or no Jewry. Some want relationships with global Jewry. Some want recognition of their groups as legitimately Jewish. And some, as you would imagine, of course, couldn't care less. Like they're fine doing what they're doing. They don't need anyone else's recognition. So it's a real broad spectrum. <laughs> For some of you who have been following some of this, some of you may know a little bit about the situation of Ethiopian Jews. If you know about that, you probably don't know that there are multiple communities of Ethiopian Jews, and you probably don't know about a whole selection of Ethiopian Jews still in Ethiopia. You might know about the ones that were brought to Israel, because there are multiple parts <coughs> of that community. So we're still talking about thousands more Jews that haven't been brought to Israel that are still living in Ethiopia. <coughs> um, for some, some people know about Uganda, some people know about South Africa and Zimbabwe. I'm happy to tell you more about it. I'm just trying to move kind of quickly through this section. Some know about Ghana. Just for today, I want you to know I, I am not the master of the universe. I'm just an ordinary scholar and a communal activist. These are the communities in Sub-Saharan Africa that I happen to know about, or know people in, or have worked with. This beautiful list. And so, <coughs> examples of countries with Jewish and Jewishly related communities across Sub-Saharan Africa run, uh, so I'm not even focusing on North Africa, what basically you have is every region of Africa today has a vibrant selection of these different kinds of communities. So we're talking about the US, but you can't understand, as you know, you can't understand anything African-American if you don't have a little bit of the concept of Africa and Africana history. So what happens if we now bring that, these millions of people, for a couple of thousand years in Sub-Saharan Africa, bring it into the United States? So now I'm going to switch 
to the U.S. part. So there's lots of books and scholarly work. There's lots of organizations and people doing their thing and making culture and spirituality, whatever. I'm an academic. I'm going to tell you some academic stuff. <coughs> there's some books on this subject. Um, one of you, some of you may know, the Church of God and Saints of Christ um, was established in Kansas, 1896. It understands itself as the oldest African-American congregation in the United States that adheres to the tenets of Judaism the way it understands itself. It has had more than 200 what it calls tabernacles or congregations with more than 37,000 members. Now we're in the U.S., okay? And then there's groups like the Commandment Keepers, founded in Harlem in 1919. <coughs> Um, by a very esteemed leader, went with Arthur Matthew, and one of the things he's known about, again, like I told you, we could do semester after semester of whole classes on this beautiful material. The black man is a Jew, and all Jew genuine Jews are black men. <coughs> um, interestingly enough, so when I, the first category, if you remember, I said normatively related to rabbinic Judaism. So what sometimes black Jews in the United States created their own associations and their own seminaries for training rabbis, because there were some challenges between them. So he's one of the founders of one of the African-American black Hebrew Israelite academies, and I'm going to tell you why that's being interesting today. We have some of you may be familiar, and some of you may come from these communities, so please speak up. <coughs> the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem, Okay, great. <laughs> they go by a variety of names. They started in Chicago. They decided to do a kind of Marcus Garvey back. They went through Libya, and now they're mostly in Demona in Israel. If we bring this back to how this works with constructions in the United States, some of you are familiar with this concept that became popularized by the name of a book, an academic article, How Jews Became White Folks. It's a very important book. There's a lot in there. Read it, but it also, a lot. She's a colleague of mine. I'm not, I don't mean to trash talk her. But anyway, there's a lot that is just wrong with this paradigm. <coughs> who were the people who were becoming white folks? Who amongst us? And in 2018, that author actually reversed her position. So <coughs> the question really is, when some people talk about, if you think I look like a normative Jew, and maybe you don't, whatever, mm -hmm. but how Jews became white folks, <coughs> we're talking about Jews from particular, from certain part of Northern Europe, my folks come from Eastern Europe, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia, Poland, all those things. But then there are these other options. Because when any of us came here, unless you were a native, we all came into racialized systems that operated in different ways than our home countries. And so it was kind of complicated. So if you know anything about this question, how did Jews in the United States become white folks? That's not the only question. The question is also how Jews became black and brown folks in the United States. And I'll just give you two paradigms from that. Breakup of the Ottoman Empire, Middle East and North Africa, major global migrations. A lot of those people, sometimes they fit in <coughs> to rabbinic traditions. A lot of times those people came in and you come into a segregated American landscape, you might be Syrian, you might be Morocco, you end up in the African American part of town in US racial segregation, right? So lots of Jews in this migration pattern, we didn't only become white folks, lots of us became black and brown folks. And then we can talk about the whole situation of situation of Caribbean Jews, there's a fantastic scholar, Louis Gordon, creator of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, he likes to remind us that a high percentage of the scholars, Caribbean scholars from the Caribbean Philosophical Association, they're all Jews. He's like, look around, they're all Jews. <laughs> and he, when he, and now he's in Connecticut, he's, he started the center when he was at Temple University, the Center for Afro-Jewish Studies. <clears throat> we had this um, really important leader, another example shaking it up, um, who, a man was born in Ethiopia, Jewish, he comes to the United States, he gets segregated into the black part of town. So he joins with these African and Israelite organizations. <laughs> and then later on, he starts to merge with European heritage Jews, forming this organization called Hassad Rishon. <clears throat> Some of the great scholars doing this, a guy in the South, Walter Isaac, he's up at Savannah State. Um, is doing some of this work because there are a hundred 
hundreds of black synagogues across the United States still today. And he is the founder of a new academic association called the Afro-Jewish Studies Association. So where are we today with these remaining, I'm gonna be wrapping up, these remaining separations and the connections? So, so far I've mostly introduced these three ways to think about the community, somewhat as if they're separate, but of course they're not at all separate. So you have, I'm gonna just give you some examples. So I don't know if some of you know Carol Olivia Heron, the author of the controversial book, Nappy Hair, right? Who is trying, feminist, trying to take back the concept and revalue um, black lookism <coughs> um, and black beauty standards. So she writes this children's book, Nappy Hair, which some people started to ban, etc. So Carol Olivia Heron, known as an African-American, Carol Olivia Heron is an African-American Jew. Her people originally come from Libya, Northern Africa, end up in a variety of ways on the, you know, you folks have those islands off the Carolinas. And so they, how do Jews become black and brown folks? Her Libyan family ends up in the Carolina, those islands, and in the United States, then they become black, right? <coughs> we have some of you might know, Rabbi Caper Spanye, you might know of him because his first cousin, his, Michelle Obama is his first cousin, and he's been on the dais at the inauguration, the two Obama inaugurations. He is the rabbi of one of these um, African Zion congregations, and he himself made the transition to also work with white Jews and traditionally rabbinical organizations, and now he's back at the head. Remember I told you there were separate black rabbinical seminaries? He's now the head, so he's spanning that difference, and he's now the head of his, the black seminaries. You mentioned the Ethiopian Jews. I would like to know your thoughts on the treatment of the Ethiopian Jews today, because these Ethiopian Jews were cut off from Israel for over a thousand years. And they maintain their Jewish culture and all of that. And Israel actually lifted them over to, to, to Israel. And can you comment on their life today? They're, I heard they're stuck in these ghetto like and they're being treated as second class. Thank you so much. Those are two great questions. One of the things I love to share, and if we have more time to really study together, is that when you're in, in the concept of continents is a political creation, and it happens over the centuries, started with the Greeks, but was taken up by European Christians. So if that's not the way you need to work the world, if you're standing in Africa, most, there's no official reason, there's no tectonic plates, some of you are science people, so correct me, there's no reason that Israel, the ancient land of Israel is not, it's been placed in Asia for various reasons, for Christian colonial reasons. But there's no other geographical reason that it, the ancient land of Israel is not Africa. And so many of the communities that we work with that I know that you probably work with too in Sub-Saharan Africa, Israel is Northeastern Africa. So sometimes people coming with European white Christian presumptions will ask questions like, and I don't mean to offend you, but you know how it's going to go. They're going to be like, oh, how do your people come to be in Africa? Well, that's a nonsensical question because my people have always been in Africa because Israel's in Africa, right? So it depends on where you're standing. So the thing about doing genetic testing is a very controversial thing. Some ways it's very helpful. African Americans and Jews specifically know that genetic testing has also often gone very badly for our communities. But there's of course some really helpful things about it. So there is a community, there's a large community referred to as a tribe called the Lemba, who is situated today in modern nation states don't follow the tribes and actual ethnicity and people. It crosses South Africa and Zimbabwe, and I've spent some time with folks and some time in South Africa. There was some genetic testing done on the leadership, kind of the buba, which is in English they call it the priestly clan. Again, these are all Christian things. <clears throat> and there was a genetic marker found. And because and people keep asking about matrilineal descent, a lot of communities around the world, to it today in the West and in Mormon Jewish communities, 
there's been a long period of understanding Jewish descent through the mother. That's not actually the whole of Jewish history, and a lot of other communities are not today, the reform movement or constructionist movement don't use that, and historically around the world. So in their communities, the descent went through the father. And they did find, again, please excuse me, I know freaking nothing about science, okay? I can study this stuff, I can share some things, but I am not a scientist. <coughs> so in the Lemba clan, the Khaleesi group of the Buba, the Lemba clan, do share, so there's an ancient Jewish caste system, which you may know about, or you know, you kind of know about, but you don't realize you know about. So um, the top is called the Kohens, and so you've probably heard Kohen, King, Khan. Those are all back from this ancient, more than 2,000 years ago, Jewish caste system. Levites are the second, so you've heard of Levitan, Levinsky, Lewinsky, all of those, Levin, Levine, Levi genes. Those are all people related to the Levite clan of the ancient Jewish customs. And then the ordinary people, people like me, Amma Aretz, ordinary folks, were called Israelites. And you've heard of Israel, you've heard that name. So you actually know about the ancient Jewish caste system, even if you didn't know you knew about it. So the Buba caste of the Lemba shares a significant set of genetic markers to Cohen class of Jews around the world. And so you're actually, you're absolutely right. Kind of what's interesting, not to be too controversial, and I don't say this to challenge anything, I just say this to inform. The history of Ethiopian Jews has a somewhat different constellation, and it's not a genetic, there's no genetic marker for Ethiopian Jews. The understanding of Ethiopian Jews as a part of the peoples of Israel is based on history, not on genetics. So interestingly enough, the Lemba clan has not necessarily been formally recognized as a group in Israel, but they have the genetic marker. Ethiopians that have mostly, again, there's difference. There's, there's the ones that are still a little bit in trouble, the ones that you know that were airlifted, those folks actually don't have a genetic marker. So genetics is a little bit complicated. Amongst the folks, the Ethiopian folks, so you're dealing, someone could give you a, one understandable way to, uh, to see this is the fact that people coming from different parts of the world in different cultures by the time in the 1980s when the Ethiopian Jews were being brought to Israel, Israel is already a modern, advanced industrial society. And most of the people coming from the Gondar region of Ethiopia were living in very rural, mountainous is partly how they survived because they were out of the way. The difference in the communities in Ethiopia is the ones that stayed more in the cities like Addis Ababa, they have a different understanding because they had to intermingle and survive in Christian Ethiopia for a long time. The ones that were more easily recognizable as their history as Jews were the ones who had fled to the mountains and they were able to keep more of their traditions more consciously intact because they were out of the way. So mostly the ones that were brought to Israel from these very rural communities, so on one hand, if you're doing mass immigration, one, you don't necessarily want, you know, people have learned, you don't necessarily want to break up your community and have two Ethiopians in this town and two Ethiopians in that town. On the other hand, if you have a town for Ethiopians, then you get into different problems which appear like segregation. So it's, I am not, I am an activist, I am not excusing any of this, but it's complicated. So, so do you think that the Ethiopian Jews, do you believe that they are a direct descendant from the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon? I, so I'm going to be honest that I feel like I don't, it's not my business to answer that question. What's my business to do is to learn their understanding of their stories. It's a beautiful rich tradition. It's a very old and ancient tradition. If you really want to know something for me, well, it works for me. I don't need to know, I, I don't personally need to answer that question. The question that seems right is that these people understand themselves this way, have lived these ways, have staved off unimaginable anti-Jewish persecution for centuries in, in Ethiopia. Good enough for me. So if that's good enough answer, I don't, in my mind, that, that's Jewish enough for me. Yes. Uh, to, to address, to kind of address that last question, uh, 
pattern for the last thing we need to trace all the way back to there. All the way back to there. And uh, to, to expand on that, the whole issue relates back to the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Kenites, and all the other things <laughs> that must be studied racially. And I think we need to do seriously. You don't do what I might do. We need a monster. I need everyone study. in this room to right. start studying this because yeah. I'm. We need a monster study. Monster study. Yes. Monster study. And lastly, I cannot hear the word astronomy without uh, what do you call them? The king's laws ringing in my head. Oh, I'm right. Uh, and people trying to kill my people. That's how I ended up here, fleeing <laughs> them. Their history <laughs> needs to be addressed. Not, Absolutely. Not along certain lines, but their, their actual history of the Caesarians as related to the Jews and the Bible, and et cetera, et cetera. Let's get real. Absolutely. And so what I want to share, so sometimes there are these questions, like I said, this, this question that literally makes no sense. How did your people come to be in Africa? Because if you're standing in Africa, we've always been there. You know, I'm saying we, but we've always been there. And so, but some people, no one asks me, Marla Brechner from Poland, Russia, Lithuania, Romania, Transylvania, like all the places in Eastern Europe. No one says, how did my people come to be in Northern Europe, right? And the thing is, it's a little confusing. How did my people come to be in Northern Europe? How did I get from your beautiful brown skin, Middle Eastern skin, how did I end up looking like this guy? I'm kind of the whitest person in my family, but I'm, <laughs> right? So the thing is, we need to know a lot more about even how do Ashkenazis become Ashkenazi. You're absolutely right. It's not just on, the, the burden is not just on one set of communities. There's ways that as much as Jews have been historically the primary other of Christian Europe, because they were internal and external, there's still ways <coughs> in which we don't understand the multiplicity because too much of what we know today still comes from European paradigms. Even though we Jews, the whole point is Jews were outside those paradigms. The research methods we get from the great universities of Europe are European or like organized colonial products. And so Jews have never, we've, we've been the targets of colonial imposition in Europe and around the world. And we all need to be doing to some of you do decolonial work. Right? So a lot of us in Jewish studies are doing decolonial Jewish work because I'm delighted to be an Ashkenazi Jew. Love it, I'm good, right? But I want to know the ways in which my mind has been colonized and my practices of study have been colonized so that we can all be asking these questions. It's not just one group, it's all.